thought this event was to give a chance first to Nora and you have to uh, give us a short over uh, background of the issues around the question of how do we live in the ruins of neoliberalism? What alternatives do we develop that, that are taking into account somehow a progressive uh, take on particularly responses to the climate crisis? Then we would have a longer presentation from Agnes to which um, I will respond and we will, then we will have uh, another presentation from Martin, right? Uh, to which Eniko will respond. Um, and then we will have Ben Benjamin uh, wrapping up. And then I'm hoping that we will will open up the floor to questions. I see we already have um, some um, questions in the chat, but I will encourage you to come up with uh, questions as uh, speakers uh, intervene. And then I, we will pick them up and and give a chance uh, for the speakers to answer them. So shall we start, please? I'm going to switch my mic and camera off with Nora. Hello everybody and thank you for coming today. So as Daniela mentioned, I'm going to give you a brief introduction uh, to the issue and to situations related to the topic in Romania. Agnes Gody in her introductory article on Solidarity Economy talks about those recent green feminist and leftist movements that attempt to provide alternative democratic anti-capitalist models which serve social reproduction rather than capital accumulation. Gody defines solidarity economy models as resisting the constraint of capital accumulation by adapting ideals of economic democracy and ecological sustainability in economical cooperation. Gody gives examples like new economics, the degrowth movement, eco-socialism, eco-feminism, or eco-socialist feminism like feminism for the 99, or Murray Bookchin's municipalism or democratic confederalism in Rojava, just to mention a few. In the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about some issues and questions, as well as some local and transnational social movements that are of utmost importance for me as an intersectional queer feminist thinker and activist in Eastern Europe more precisely in Romania. In the neoliberal financialized capitalized, capitalist system, capital accumulation is only possible because of the unpaid reproductive work of mostly women and because of the underpaid labor of, well, everyone, but mostly racialized people of the global south. In a post-socialist, constantly auto-colonizing neoliberal Romania, the areas of social reproduction, such as housing, education, healthcare, childcare, and elderly care, are in the process of privatization and marketization. Not only that the reproductive labor of women are not recognized by the conditions that make social reproduction possible are being restructured as profit-oriented commodities. In the global north, the transition from a welfare state to a neoliberal one has happened before. That is why many of the movements described by Godi as relevant to solidarity economy are from there. I think Romania and Eastern Europe in general is in a special position regarding the possibilities of anti-capitalist action because it is caught between the imperialist neoliberal exploitation of the global north and the auto-colonizing attempts of the local liberal elites, both under a so-called progressive agenda, but there are also the neoconservative or alt-right forces that seemingly resist the globalizing attempts of the West but they are actually just another manifestation of capitalism reproducing itself through fascism and an authoritarian state. We not only need to resist the colonial, racist, imperialist and patriarchal capitalist expansion, we also need to avoid auto-colonization and fight back the excluding hateful politics of the local and global right. Without exoticizing the East, so organizing from a self-critical approach, we need to develop transnational solidarity movements and economic models in Eastern Europe and in the global South so that to resist the expansion of capitalist accumulation, but also to apply a decolonial and redistributive approach to global and local resistance. We live in times of a climate crisis, the crisis of care, most recently in times of a healthcare crisis and the financial crisis induced by the COVID-19 pandemic, but we could also say that all of these are part of and different manifestations of the crisis of capitalism we have been experiencing in the last few decades. Capitalism usually benefits from crisis and reproduces itself through them, but many of us think that this rupture in the so-called normality caused by the newest crisis, the pandemic, is a crucial point to cultivate radical transnational intersectional solidarity 
so as not to go back to this so-called normal. The Feminism for the 99 Manifesto has already asked for such a movement and amid the pandemic many more such manifestos appeared that call for transnational action. And uh, under the acronym EAST, which means Essential Autonomous Struggles Transnational, a group of intersectional radical leftist activists, including me and many other fellow Romanians, has started organizing on the basis of transnational solidarity in an Eastern European context during the pandemic. So far, we have organized webinars around the topics of housing and care work, and we also managed to give place for a transnational assembly in which more than 60 activists participated from around the world. In the Fordulat issue, there are analyzed many aspects of a solidarity economy, for example, commoning, cooperative housing, food sovereignty, the re reorganizing of care, just to mention a part of them. Issues related to housing and social reproduction are made even more visible by the pandemic, and this is especially true in Romania. We were sent home, but many of us doesn't have homes or home doesn't mean safety. According to the statistics of the Block for Housing, which is a network of housing rights activist groups of the country, in Romania, the rate of social housing is the lowest in the EU, only 1.23% of the housing stock. The rate of poverty and social exclusion is the highest in Romania across the EU, is 33%. Approximately half of the Romanian population lives in overcrowded apartments and tenants with average salary spend more than 60% of their incomes on housing in bigger cities. According to Eurostat data uh, 2018, compared to the incomes, housing has the highest price in Romania across the EU and in the last 12 years, housing prices has risen by 55%, while the EU average is only 20%. The social housing stock is not being broadened and sometimes one has to wait as long as 20 years to get social housing or most probably you won't get it at all. In the new issue of Fordula there is an article about cooperative housing giving two examples of tenant cooperatives, one from Uruguay and one from Germany, then mentioning some Eastern European initiatives. Unfortunately in Romania we don't have tenant cooperatives even though we would very much need it. However, we have housing right activist groups in major cities and they are very well organized. Actually, the, today me and Enrique participated in an event to make the housing crisis more visible. About housing activism in Romania, I'm sure you are going to hear more about my comrade Enrique Vince. The time has been long come from transnational solidarity, but in urgent times like this, in times for many crises, organizing becomes even more urgent and as well as harder. As I mentioned before, I would call for a transnational autonomous decolonial intersectional queer feminist organizing, which takes into consideration our differences, but unites our voices to make them heard and more visible, and eventually to promote transformative action. But how and where to start? And I'm hopeful that today we are going to discuss something like this. And also that housing is definitely an important topic in this. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for leaving us the difficult questions uh, for the rest of the panelists. Uh, you have, please. Uh, I will try to be a bit stricter on time, so we have time to talk. Uh, please, no more than five to seven minutes, so the, um, then we, we have more time for discussion. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so uh, thank you, Daniela. Uh, and I will be reiterating a few um, of the ideas uh, mentioned by Nora, and I will also uh, pose some uh, questions that I do consider important and I do believe that uh, the other participants will address uh, during this discussion. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, reiterate uh, what Nora has previously talked about, um, the uh, observance of how capitalism, this uh, system based on uh, cycles of uh, crises and expansions, um, uh, utilizes uh, paid and unpaid reproductive work uh, and the non-productive work as well as our ecosystem as uh, cheap or free resources uh, to sustain uh, the basically infinite accumulation of capital. Uh, now during the discussion we have the opportunity to focus on the possibilities of both fighting this uh, oppressive system and sustaining the people organized ourselves by uh, creating organizations and economies based on solidarity. Um, I would like to mention other um, 
a work um, in the for, in the 27th for the issue um, uh, in which uh, Andrea Cerva and Loren Laszlo Noemi, and Noemi Katona discuss uh, the question of organizing care work and care workers uh, practice that is becoming uh, more common uh, in the Eastern European region uh, as well. And um, we can uh, see how uh, both uh, caregivers and people receiving care uh, are organizing themselves. Uh, the latter uh, pointing to the emerging need of cooperatives addressing not only the needs of workers but also the needs of consumers. Um, while uh, taking into, uh, into account the organizations of uh, the Global West, a lot of uh, which uh, are uh, discussed uh, in uh, Cervan, uh, Laszlo and uh, Katona's work, uh, I do consider it important and would like to uh, create space for participants to talk about uh, the, in the initiatives uh, stemming uh, from the Latin American Niuna Menus movement, as uh, well as a number of Eastern European organizations, e.g. Uh, the Polish Iniciativa Pracownista, uh, the uh, Workers' Initiative, uh, the Hungary-based Centers for Women and Mothers, uh, address uh, addressing the needs of families with small children, uh, with special regards to the Regina Center, a community center developed uh, with the municipalist approach. Um, I also believe that uh, the organization uh, DREPT, Trek Pentru Ingrigire, should be mentioned, an organization that is set out to protect and fight for the rights of caregivers in Austria, uh, care workers in Austria, sorry, uh, where uh, there is an estimated number of 60,000 employed uh, care workers, 90% of whom are women, and uh, most of whom uh, come from uh, the Eastern European region, typically from Romania and Slovakia. Um, as uh, organizations uh, organized from the bottom up uh, grow, uh, it is inevitable uh, to include uh, and cooperate with multiple actors, uh, including hierarchical uh, for-profit institutions and uh, the state. Uh, I do believe that the ways and means of cooperation, uh, cooperation as uh, it uh, raises many questions, are to be further discussed. Um, I would also like to make an opportunity uh, for participants to address uh, current events, the rise of uh, cons uh, neoconservatism and right-wing politics as uh, policy changes um, advocated for and made in these uh, political uh, structures uh, are therefore uh, are uh, able um, to sustain uh, both uh, formally and materially uh, among other inequalities, gender inequalities also, and uh, therefore have uh, an effect uh, of uh, the heavily gendered uh, and racialized uh, reproductive work. Um, moving on, uh, I would uh, also invite participants to uh, talk about uh, solidarity economic models that uh, they have uh, had experience working in uh, or have. Um, had the opportunity to study. Uh, I uh, do believe that describing these models and um, uh, are important uh, knowledge uh, to be shared, um, as well as uh, talking about the questions or uh, the possible limitations of these models uh, or the hardships uh, that uh, the organized people uh, working with these models can face. Um, I uh, do believe that these limitations have to be discussed uh, as we have to work around them. Uh, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of the questions that interests me the most uh, is uh, how at times of crisis uh, this capitalist system basically relies on these economies that uh, save and preserve its working force uh, that uh, and whom uh, at the times of expansion can uh, be further exploited. And um, I do believe that a commons-based uh, solidarity model uh, would present opportunities uh, to stop, uh, stop and break this um, 
this um, system. Okay. Apologies, uh, I did a lot of Zooms, but I still forget to unmute myself. Thank you for setting the context. Uh, Agnes, can I ask you to please now take over and walk us through how we resolve contradictions and what do we do? <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. Uh, I will try to say something, but not sure, you know, it will solve any, everything. It's quite a big problem. Uh, just to give a basic perspective on how we work uh, and how this issue of Fordulat was uh, uh, produced together with Solidarity Economy Center. So indeed, as you said, the horizon was not that much neoliberalism. Uh, first of all, because what you see in Hungary is not so much neoliberalism, but rather what comes up in capitalist crisis management, what comes after neoliberalism. And, uh, the other reason is that uh, neoliberalism is usually defined in contrast to post-war achievements of uh, social spending and redistribution, but in face of the climate crisis, the model of global capitalist growth on which this uh, kind of redistribution was based uh, seems completely unsustainable. Uh, so the horizon was rather this uh, major challenge of transforming uh, the whole global economy to avoid the climate catastrophe. Uh, and in this sense, of course, this uh, recently very visible uh, wave of uh, solidarity, economy, degrowth, uh, eco-socialism, eco-feminism, social reproduction theory, uh, commons-based initiatives uh, is very inspirational. Uh, but we see this wave uh, as part of a longer global history of uh, this dynamic relation between uh, reproductive economies and, uh, and capitalist cycles. Uh, and in terms of crisis, what is important in this relation is, is this tendency to compensate the uh, capital's crisis by outs outsourcing the costs of reproduction to uh, often informal uh, reproductive uh, economies. And uh, maybe in an abstract sense, this uh, sounds uh, not so familiar, but in fact, in Eastern Europe, we are completely familiarized with it. Uh, with it. Uh, just think of instances like uh, working for more jobs, but also f uh, producing food for your own consumption and having these informal community economies of uh, distributing that kind of food or uh, taking care of children and elderly at home or uh, maintaining uh, otherwise unsustainable levels of debt service uh, through help from the extended family where the whole family actually works as a reproductive economy to uh, sustain the family, but through that, through that also sustain the uh, debt-based debt accumulation. Uh, so this kind of uh, economies in Eastern Europe, like in other semi-periphery and peripheries are uh, quite well spread. Um, what is rather the problem is that structurally they are uh, subordinated uh, to the capitalist uh, crisis management. They, they work like bottom-up subsidies to capital in crisis. Uh, so in this sense, where we saw this, the, the, the very direct use uh, of this new wave on uh, solidarity economy and commons innovations uh, was that these very technical uh, innovations and collaborations that they produce uh, they can be uh, of help in uh, creating institutionalized infrastructures that can connect instances of reproductive economies and uh, shield them from uh, at the external market logic. Uh, and the way uh, Solidarity Economy Center in Budapest uh, was founded and, and what it tries to do is it exactly this, to facilitate the growth of such uh, connected solidarity economy uh, ecosystems. Uh, and what uh, it does, uh, Solidarity Economy Center uh, at the moment is, uh, well, basically it's three levels. Uh, it does uh, research and consultancy. Uh, it works on uh, connecting existing initiatives and facilitate practical collaborations between them, but also knowledge exchange uh, in terms of uh, Solidarity Economy innovation, how to do it. Uh, and also it builds model projects in areas that we consider of key importance uh, and what is uh, going on now uh, are projects on uh, 
food sovereignty uh, on community energy and projects on uh, union cooperative collaborations uh, which we find uh, uh, quite important uh, now there are two such projects on care work on care work and housing can you hear me is, is everything fine Yeah, so the union cooperative collaborations are on care work at housing. Uh, I would say just a bit uh, on the end about the care work uh, project. Um, so here, um, along the lines uh, that uh, uh, Nora and uh, Kincher explained, uh, the care work working group started to work with the social workers union, uh, and they did a collaborative research on uh, on the care work loads of members. Uh, not only in their work, but also at home, uh, mostly in child and elderly care. And they work together uh, now after the research on integrating the, the proposals based on the lessons of the research into the union's collective contract. Um, this is what I wanted to say. I'm sorry about the phone. I, I hope it's not sorry in trying to tell me that something is wrong with them. <laughs> um, hmm. As a, the chair of this session, I'm a bit confused of, uh, Agnes, are you okay? Uh, have you finished your intervention? Yes. Ah, you have finished. Uh, or you're okay? <laughs> I'm okay and I finished. You're okay and you have finished. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, it falls on to me now, um, to give uh, a couple of comments to Agnes's intervention. I will give this comment um, from the perspective of uh, macroeconomies. So please take that into account uh, in the kind of questions that I ask. I, I want to formulate them as questions rather than comments because in a sense, I'm, I'm a, a newcomer to this concept of the solidarity economy. I want to understand more about it. And I've, I've been doing a little bit of reading uh, around the work that Agnes and her colleagues have done. And I have two sort of basic questions. I think it's, it's quite a seductive concept to think about the solidarity economy because it somehow sounds in a sense that it places us outside the sort of capitalist logic of profit accumulation and particularly the, the destructive aspects of capitalist uh, reproduction that, uh, on, on climate. But I wonder, Agnes, about the way in which you kind of uh, uh, situate the solidarity economy in, in, in relationship to capitalist accumulation as a form of subsidy, right? So you're saying it's a form of subsidy, you said it's a bottom-up subsidy to, to capitalist in, capitalism in crisis. And uh, to me, and in, in some of the articles that I've read, and Agnes uh, maybe can share with the rest of you um, uh, uh, some of the things that they've written, because this clarifies in greater detail the concept of the solidarity economy, she, dis she discusses there the idea of food networks, right? And it reminded me of my grandmother and my mother making all sorts of uh, Romanian preserves over winter and then shipping them to me all the way to the UK uh, through some very dodgy channels, but uh, I, I, I won't go into that. My question is, if we op oppose the solidarity economy to capitalist accumulation, but we also think of it as a form of subsidy, uh, then... Um, are you suggesting somehow that we don't want to displace uh, markets and commodification? Uh, is, I, I don't understand why this is a, a problem in some ways, uh, particularly if you think about the, the, the impact, the, the, the sort of carbon footprint of capitalist accumulation. What, why does it matter that it's a subsidy? I mean, I think we should judge its, its mer uh, conceptual merits and its uh, sort of empirical mer merits on its own, separate from capitalist accumulation, uh, in the sense of I, I'm very happy to give a lot of subsidies to capitalist accumulation if it means decommodification one way or another, right, of, of relationships of, of any sort. So that's one question. The second question is, 
Are you suggesting that initiative like yours, in a sense, because they're subsidy to capitalism, are they delaying the inevitable destruction of capitalism? Are you doing capitalism a favor by, 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 with this sort of initiatives? And the third question that I have, which comes from the, my, my uh, sort of instincts as a macroeconomist, is that we typically bracket the state out of these conversations in the sense that um, the, the, the state doesn't exist, or if it exists, it, it's viewed as an, a sort of enemy of either an ally of, of capitalists and, the cap and capital or, uh, or uh, uh, an obstacle to forms of solidarity economy, if I understand correctly. And it reminded me, I, I would like to uh, ask you for some more conceptual clarification about what does the, the, this concept of solidarity economy mean, mean for a progressive left politics of welfare, right? Because there is a recent conversation in particular in development studies that says, look, in most countries, work is disappearing. I mean, it's not the case in Eastern Europe, but it may be the case now with, with the pandemic that work is disappearing, uh, at least forms of partic uh, formal participation in the labor market. The two, two touchstones of progressive politics of welfare from the 20th century, which are, is the worker and the nation state are with sort of shrinking and shrinking one way or another in some spaces. So what does your uh, concept, how does it help us think through, well, how, do, how do we think politics of welfare now? Right. Uh, I think that's that's one of the most. I'm not very clear that I I have an answer from reading your your work, and I would like to invite you to tell us, uh, particularly thinking about the concept of power in this, because solidarity economies don't resolve issues of power that that are intersectional, uh, and I have my own experience of being involved in solidarity networks where these issues of power remain. Um, but I would like to just think with you about what is a progressive politics of welfare look from a solidarity economy perspective. And I will stop here and then invite our next panelist. I, I think if you're happy, we will, Sorin and the organizers, we will go like this. We will collect questions uh, after the, or interventions after the presentations and then ask the participants to respond. Um, so our next uh, presenter is Marton, please. Okay. Uh, I think I will be a little bit more, uh, I don't know, concrete after these abstract questions. So uh, in this recent Fordulat, uh, there is an article about uh, cooperative housing, which was written by uh, Juzi Poshvai and Chabaya Nekwar, researchers of the Peripheria Policy and Research Center. And together with them, is it working? Yeah. Uh, we have been working on the setting up a housing cooperative in Hungary since 2010. Obviously, it's a kind of a long project because it's a major capital investment and because of the lack of cheap loans and uh, other issues, it, it takes a lot of time to experiment with such a thing. Uh, so obviously, the the uh, it's more at this point we have. Uh, one house which with six tenants but uh, so we imagine this housing cooperative as land rent based because uh, without uh, uh, alternative financial institution uh, in a solidarity economy network uh, it's quite hard to 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 leave and uh, enter uh, housing cooperatives uh, without major capital investment. In that case, uh, there is a legal entity uh, which can be a cooperative or should be a cooperative in an ideal uh, world. And uh, members and tenants are owners of, of, of this uh, legal entity. They pay rent for it. Uh, and then uh, that entity is responsible for uh, the financial and organizational sustainability of such a project. Uh, this obviously is uh, this kind of uh, tenant owner based model provides in many terms an affordable and stable housing. And uh, because there is no investor or middleman in that uh, uh, scheme, uh, which try to make profit. Uh, 
in this model when what we're working out uh, it's also connected uh, in to energy cooperatives uh, when there is a major investment uh, in, in the uh, normal real estate market obviously the the investor is not that uh, interested in in setting up uh, solar panels or other alternative energy sources because it uh, raises the cost of the investment and then uh, it also lowers the profit margin and in this case the tenants obviously in the long term uh, benefit from from such an investment and it's also kind of a hub uh, which is connected to other kind of cooperatives we uh, work in this year setting up a consumer cooperative which also connects agricultural small agricultural producers and obviously like in a place where i don't know 20 uh, people live together it's also kind of a, uh, a place where the to which the co consumer cooperative can uh, join and in our case obviously it responds many of the aforementioned uh, crises uh, like the housing crisis in Hungary, or the it's very similar to other uh, Eastern European countries. Uh, it's an own ownership-dominated housing market, uh, which obviously was hit first with the financial crisis and the following skyrocketing of the interest rate, and then uh, following that process, the skyrocketing of rents. Uh, and in such a cooperative uh, form, it's also kind of a response of, of, of crisis of social reproduction because of the tenant because the tenants can share responsibilities of care work and other uh, uh, other forms of work. And it's at this point uh, of the project, it is a solution for people with stable but low income, like teachers, healthcare workers, social workers, and also for people who are employed in atypical forms of employment, such as short-term contracts and seasonal work. Uh, yeah. okay. uh, but in practice, what we do now uh, is that we, two years ago, the first uh, house was in established with six tenants uh, connecting and uh, but as uh, in most of the other cases it was apparent that one cooperative is basically unsustainable because it's too much reliant on the on the life cycle of the participants or like uh, contingencies uh, and without a network in which it is embedded uh, it's very likely that in the in the long term it it will be reprivatized or gets out from the from the net from the solidarity economy network so because of that we are now working on the second house which is uh, which would be a little bit bigger like with 18 tenants and in the meantime, setting up the umbrella organization, which connects these houses. And in the meantime, giving the responsibilities of this kind of political organization, which is capable to, to block reprivatization. And then the other one is, uh, is we're participating in an Eastern European network of, of housing cooperative. It's called the MOBA. Uh, which is already a European Cooperative Society. It aims to assist and fund uh, uh, the establishment of the individual networks in each of the member countries, which are Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Czech Republic, and Hungary. Uh, and uh, we recognize that such a kind of financial intermediary is necessary because of the lack of access to the cheap loans in the in these localities which which really prevents uh, making these projects reali re realizable uh, so at this point uh, we set up like a uh, a fund which in a which in a short term capable to 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 
assist uh, the work of, of these different uh, uh, networks. And then the third one is uh, what Aggie already mentioned, is, the, is working together with unions uh, to map and work out the possibilities of establishing a network for union members. And that is essential, as Aggie already said about, that apart from the everyday work and regular employment the, the union members have, many of the, of the care work and reproductive, because of the many care work and reproductive work they have to do, it's kind of impossible to, to meaningfully uh, participate in the, in, the, in the organizational work of the union. And uh, through that uh, institution, establishing institutions of, of social reproduction, such as housing and, and, and care, uh, that also kind of ensures that that uh, that stability is provided by the union for the members for organizational work and uh, obviously from the perspective of the union which ha doesn't have uh, at least in Hungary uh, strong or more enough <laughs> it's not strong enough and doesn't have enough members uh, it made this uh, these welfare services make them uh, uh, more desirable. And I think that's the 10 minutes. Thank you, Marton. Uh, Enika, do you want to take over and respond, please? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I have read uh, Marton's uh, older paper, which Sorin uh, shared on the event a few days ago, and as well as the, the article of Jelinek and Poshvai in this recent number of, of Fordulat. So I, I prepared a little bit uh, based on those readings, and but also, um, obviously, I will, I will um, react directly to Martin's presentation, and we'll have some, some questions to that at the end. Uh, of my intervention. First, uh, yeah, I would like just to um, um, join all of us uh, in, in this uh, um, satisfaction, actually, seeing so many people interested in the topic. Uh, and it's no wonder because, because this initiative, which is presented uh, today by our comrades from Hungary, is actually about a, a challenge, a call for all of us to rethink home ownership, to rethink tenure, to rethink finance, and at the end of the day, uh, economy. And uh, uh, I, liked, uh, I, I, liked, uh, I would like to highlight two things that I like very much in these papers. Uh, the first one is the, how they actually, uh, this, these analyses are an example of how activism and research uh, go together um, in very many cases. So I like very much how uh, uh, the, the collective who initiated the Rakutsi collective uh, actually uh, reflected during their whole uh, process on what actually is happening to them. So it's not only an analysis of Hungarian housing policies historically and contextually today, but it's also a reflection on the process through which they went through uh, in relation with banks looking for bank loans, in relations with public authorities looking for potential support uh, from them, but also in relation with, uh, with the real estate investors. Um, yeah, uh, the, the second, uh, the second uh, aspect that uh, I would like to highlight here, I like more, but um, uh, these two I wanted to emphasize now, um, it's how uh, the, the initiative itself, the House uh, Rakots Collective uh, and the broader initiative uh, connects two aims. Uh, one of the aim is to uh, to create a housing stock which is protect, protected from, from uh, the, the logic of capital accumulation and profit making in housing. And the other aim is to, uh, to create a space for people who, um, 
who want to live collectively on the base of a, a very clear principles, which are collective ownership, uh, um, um, collective uh, administration, um, assuming accountability, even economic contribution from members to the maintenance of the of the cooperative housing, democratic organization, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, and also the the principle of uh, of autonomy, being autonomous from the state, and um, yeah, this this question that Daniela already raised now, it's it's very important here. I this was one of my questions as well. How can we imagine uh, um, to become totally autonomous from the state under conditions in which uh, the state continues to be a powerful actor in, in capitalism and is it has uh, a huge uh, uh, power to, to redistribute resources right so uh, how can we afford to leave that redistribution logic uh, on on mechanisms by which the state actually uh, supports uh, capital accumulation and neglects its uh, its social its social roles um okay so um what we can also um what we can also read in this this tags but but also it's all over here in the in the debate uh, we are mostly from Central and Eastern Europe um, here around this Zoom meeting, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 really quite timely to uh, to put these questions. So, which are the specificities of uh, of housing in in former uh, real uh, uh, socialist countries? Uh, how they are. Uh, um, continue to act as semi-peripheries of global capitalism. What does this mean from the point of view of, of the housing market, of how housing is financialized, on how mortgages are, are functioning? Uh, so this is a very important issue across our countries, Serbia, Hungary, Czech Republic, etc. Romania, obviously. Then we again also share the the the, the challenge to to deal with the socialist uh, housing regime. So we need to to ask ourselves what can we uh, learn about those uh, about that regime, which was um, actually very diverse from the point of view of home ownership. Uh, and and what was good, what was bad, and how can we uh, maybe reinvent the the idea of public housing in order to make it more suitable to to respond to people's housing needs and to protect the 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 housing stock created by public budget from the interference of uh, privatization. Uh, again, uh, another uh issue that we all share across countries is is how um, privatization went on including housing privatization in our countries how actually the policies of um, large international financial organizations put a stamp on all these and how actually housing was a central uh, domain by which and through which the transformation of really existing socialism into neoliberal capitalism happened. So we, we we all need to, when we are looking for solutions, we all need to uh, acknowledge all these all these uh, characteristics. Plus, I guess uh, we also want to learn from what happened in uh, um, developed capitalist countries, so to speak. Uh, how their um, social housing uh, uh, system was developed, but actually it was it became a private social housing system. How um, I don't know, uh, big housing companies actually uh, became uh, owners of tens and thousands and uh, of, of 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 homes, right? So. We definitely want to avoid those uh, those uh, developments. 
when we are thinking about about solutions. Uh, here in, in, in Cluj, uh, our, our movement, Kersh uh, Socialia Cum Social Housing Now, um, um, is very much focused on rethinking public housing and, and claiming public investment into public housing, um, which is, uh, I guess, a good, a good topic to talk here about. So how can we imagine cooperative housing and rethought re public housing as two solutions complete each other in, in our effort to, uh, uh, to, to create more and more non-for-profit housing right and i don't know uh, one day in the in the future to 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 have an impact through this even on how uh, uh, the housing market and uh, market economy functions in the in a, in our societies um so maybe we can we can also have a discussion on that if i don't know public housing can we imagine public housing as a common? Uh, if yes, uh, what that, that would mean, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, and um, so and the third question, a very direct one, maybe uh, to, to to what I learned from Rakotsi Collective's experience. Um, it it seems to me that yeah that the the initiative has a, a an internal uh, uh, tension. Uh, uh, what I'm thinking about, uh, about the fact that uh, the cooperative that you um, you created or you said ideal, ideally should be should have been created because it, you couldn't do it actually due to structural obstacles in Hungary. Um, but yes, if um, if they, this cooperative uh, um, have to uh, make uh, have to provide for financial resources for a collective housing. Then, in this case, has to go to the banks or or other institutions that could provide loans. So, actually, I see the cooperative as part of the market economy. Uh, why, in the relationship between the cooperative and the, and, and the members? I see the the other logic of not uh, uh, of uh, of uh, of being non-profit of being uh, out from the the influence of the of the market market. So actually, I see that this is a, a tension in internal tension in this concept of of cooperative housing as part of larger capitalist uh, political economy. Yeah, thank you. Great, Annick. Uh, many thanks. Uh, can I first invite Agi and Martin to respond to our comments and then we'll take questions from the audience who I see we have already a couple. So, Agi first. Yes, thanks a lot. So, why is it a problem if uh, solidarity economy works as a subsidy to capital in crisis? Uh, well, in, in the sense that it helps people survive, uh, it's not a problem, but in the sense if, if you're uh, aim is to transform the whole of the economy, which we really have to do now, uh, uh, then it's a problem because uh, it uses people's uh, self-sustainance to uh, to help capital uh, survive the crisis and transform. So, uh, you know, it, it keeps you in uh, in poverty and uses your, your self-sustainance to, uh, to maintain a system that in the end is going to kill us all. Uh, but it is actually structurally the same problem with taxation that uh, that was one of the comments uh, in the chat, uh, or or um, the question of, of, of unions struggle uh, for workers' uh, share of capital uh, because or, I mean workers' share of profit uh, because if you only fight to to create a larger margin that is used for reproductive uh, reasons uh, from capital's gains, then your interest is uh, for capital's gains to increase. And in order for capital's gains to increase, it will have to exploit uh, uh, other people's uh, 
reproduction and other ecological uh, uh, systems reproduction. And this used to be, you know, the, the classic uh, division of labor between the global north and global south in the uh, post-war period, which we look back to as a good example sometimes to for uh, redistribution. So. Uh, how how would you imagine the the role of the state or progressive redistribution in this scenario when your job is to actually transform the whole system? Um, then um, the way we see it is this: that yes, of course, the state is uh, is completely necessary because it can open channels and also close channels uh, that are deadly and open channels that that make it possible for solidarity economies to grow. And, and this we see in long-term collaborations in India and Kerala between uh, uh, communist governments and the uh, uh, cooperative and union collaborations, or, or we see it in the, in the Latin American pink wave in the 2000s. Uh, but we also see that uh, once you are in the government seat uh, uh, of a state, you have to manage a national economy that at all points is connected to uh, the capitalist uh, processes. Uh, and and really nobody can guarantee that uh, you can focus on growing solidarity economy and not on maintaining your, those processes. You really have to do that if you're in the management seat. And this is what we saw in the case of uh, Latin American uh, regimes. Uh, and because of this, uh, the, the part of the solidarity economy would be to, to grow and also uh, constitute a, a relative autonomy, uh, an economic uh, background in itself that can also go against the state when it needs to. Uh, unlike state redistribution, which if the state stops it, then it just stops. Uh, and, and this was the argument uh, that was also presented in, uh, in the Fordula text uh, of, uh, of one of the Syriza uh, members who, uh, who whose anal analysis was this, that that's, if Syriza would, would have collaborated with the, uh, with the solidarity economy initiatives that were uh, proliferating uh, after the crisis, it could have built a background based on which it could have said no to Troika, but it didn't have that. It had uh, democratic uh, votes, but, uh, but no economic background that would have been autonomous. May I say also something to the housing question? What about timing? Uh, if you can do it in one minute, go. Because it's it's another uh, essential question that Aniko asked, which is the same, like with the state, it's the same with the cooperative. Uh, if you are just one unit uh, within a capitalist market, you're going to incorporate it into your workings. And, and that uh, is, is an eternal tension. Uh, so uh, the main thing is to, to create uh, connections uh, that facilitates an alternative uh, uh, circulation and and also create other connections that shield you uh, from external uh, markets. For instance, if you need to take uh, loans as a housing cooperative, it is better if you can access uh, uh, cooperative uh, loans. If you cannot, this tension is bigger. So this is why you know the multiplication of these units and creating uh, an ecosystem that can have broader circuits uh, is so important because otherwise, of course, this is the main technical challenge of the whole uh, process that at every moment you meet uh, the requirements of the external market. Okay, thank you, Agi. If I understood correctly, your answer is that we shouldn't try to occupy the state because then we might find ourselves basically channeling too much energy into into reproducing our the power uh, as opposed to growing the solidarity economy. But maybe I, I misunderstood you. We'll come back to that, Martin, please. I, 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 can I answer to that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as we imagine it, uh, that these are complementary necessary struggles. So like there is obviously the network in which, which provides means of social reproduction and also like whoever enters in a movement and already not enters not only with the promise that if a party would uh, succeed then he or she would get this and that but in the meantime his or her necessary i mean means of social reproduction are also satisfied that's one thing but obviously as 
if the, as was the case with Kerala, the state can be used to strengthen these kind of initiatives, but it is more, uh, what's called, uh, the very, it is more uh, integrated in, 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 in the global capital sphere system, and then it needs to respond. And if there is a change in, in terms of uh, power, then the movement can sustain itself in, in the solidarity economy uh, network and initiative. Uh, but I think to my question, to, <laughs> to Anika's question, I already answered with the, with the, with the network that uh, obviously, yeah, if there is one unit, it is more uh, reliant on, 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 on capitalist uh, relations. Uh, and obviously our goal is to to make these complementary functions within one uh, ecosystem and obviously finance is, is, is a very important one uh, and uh, for and housing is one of the means through which you can suck in capital and then redistribute it in one system through uh, like as we mentioned consumer cooperatives energy cooperatives and other uh, cooperatives of, I don't know, constructions. I think that's... Uh, are you, have you finished, Martin? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Do you. Shall we look at the questions in the chat? So there was, there was a question on, uh, I don't know if you want to address that, uh, particularly in relationship to, the, the question of taxation in relationship to the idea of um, promoting or um, sort of mobilizing um, sustainable uh, energy sources for housing, whether that's something that fits within the overall broader logic of the solidarity economy or the way in which we organize alternative forms of, of housing. Um, so I don't know if you or Agi want to take that first. I mean, Agi talked about uh, about taxes, but I, I'm I'm wondering whether there is something more specific to say to the question of of the sort of greenhousing um, in relationship to this. I will say something shortly, and uh, maybe Benjamin, who is uh, in the energy working group, might uh, also want to say something. Just uh, we should check. Uh, so on, uh, on the question of green transition and financing uh, uh, green transition, uh, uh, we are closest to, to the views of the trade unions uh, for energy democracy to add. Uh, and their idea is that uh, the broader uh, union movement uh, should promote a green transition that is uh, not limited by the requirements of profitability. Uh, so you can, you need to transform more and faster uh, than what you can expect from uh, for market initiatives. Uh, even you know, even if uh, as as in the past decade, uh, states have been subsidizing uh, green energy. We saw that it didn't. Uh, uh, it, it didn't cause a growth in green energy uh, as much as it is needed. And meanwhile, there was a parallel growth in fossil, fossil energy use that was uh, even bigger. And uh, um, what, uh, what TUED uh, promotes is that uh, you need to be able to take actions uh, that make transition uh, possible uh, even if they are not profitable. And for this, you need to go against privatizations. If possible, you need to uh, reclaim uh, uh, energy into uh, public ownership and community ownership. Uh, and, and this is what uh, their actions are about. So uh, taxation is, is one uh, a tool, but you really need to transform the whole uh, system of property uh, in uh, energy systems and the whole system in financing energy systems in order to uh, be able to achieve green transition. 
Thank you. Uh, I, I like that we're going back to a, a cohabitation with the state, at least in financing some of the, or in organizing some of the green transition in energy. Martin, do you want to respond to this question of taxes and, and green energy or green housing? Uh, ben, Ben, do you want to say something? Varda? Well, I, I agree with what Aggie said. So I haven't introduced myself. I'm Benjamin Markus. I coordinate the energy working group in the Solidarity Economy Center. So yes, in a big part, I agree. But I, I agree with what Aggie said that uh, that you cannot uh, let, leave the state out of the whole equation. You need the state in uh, if you want to really build green energy and and uh, community energy because this. Currently, the state controls a whole lot of the whole system you want to change in this uh, sector. And uh, there is no way of, of doing it uh, without the state or just, uh, I don't know, discarding it. And yes, that, that interaction with the state can take the form of, of uh, financial structures or, or uh, legal structures. And that transformation is already happening as well um yeah so yes i i think it's it is part of the of the road i don't know if it answered the question well i mean vlad if vlad wants to in, in, I'm, I'm to me we have already debated it and i'm i think at length but if there are more questions or clarifications that people want in relationship to this maybe just chuck them in the chat box and we will um address them and then the next one is a question that uh, either Martin or Enike might want to address because it has to do with the privatization of the housing stock in Eastern Europe and its impact on uh, ownership and redistribution if I understand the question correctly would you like to say something about that Martin? As far as I understood the question it's about that after the transition many of the houses were in the hand, I mean, prioritized from the public stock, and uh, but yeah, it is true. And there are some numbers that 96% in Romania, somebody wrote that, uh, but, but I don't get the question. Um, related to that, can I say something to this? Yes, yes. Uh, so. Uh, so there is this thing that after privatization, most many people, very many people got uh, home ownership. So that can be understood as a good thing, right? Uh, but one of the uh, things was that uh, the state uh, couldn't do maintenance uh, due to the general crisis of socialist economies and their uh, public debt service. Uh, and like this, the, the costs of, uh, of uh, Delapidation cost of maintenance needs was uh, privatized to uh, small ten tenants, and uh, this was one of the causes of uh, housing uh, poverty. The uh, people couldn't pay for those, and then that's how they were uh, pushed out of, of houses that were privatized to them. Uh, and another major effect was that in these situations of what they call super home owner ownership, uh, you don't have rental, you cannot move and the uh, next uh, generations, uh, they don't have access to housing. And uh, this was the case until the big uh, uh, loan boom in the uh, 2000s, uh, which led to debt crisis in uh, most of these countries. Uh, so uh, on the long run, uh, it didn't help that much. Hi, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Thanks a lot. I just wanted to clarify this question if, if, if I can. Yeah, because, yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, reply by the last person. I kind of jumped in into this meeting, a friend of mine invited me, so I'm sorry if I'm a bit off topic. But I, I was just asking this in terms of, um, yeah, I'm currently, for instance, residing in Germany and, and the ownership of housing um, here is very little. And you basically, not everyone has a parent who owns something. Um, whereas in my context in Lithuania, kind of everyone has basically a parent who owns something so even if you're in the big city and you're struggling with rent 
um, you can always fall back into a house if it's in a village or in a smaller town perhaps or even in the bigger town so I was coming since this discussion is in standards about the solidarity economy and more especially on the housing issues yeah I was just interested in this kind of also contextual and also maybe geographical distinctions between you know or complexity inside of Eastern Europe where perhaps in, in Lithuania let's say I mean of course there are a lot of problems in housing as well especially in the biggest cities but they're maybe not that intense um, yeah as I don't know in Romania so I was just wondering or Hungary yeah um, what is the the ownership regime if you all like maybe you all have like grandparents or parents where you can fall back onto um, and they're in this context and solidarity economy I think plays a bit different um, has different intensity than let's say I don't know in Germany where kind of not ownership is not that big that's it thanks if, I don't know if Martin oh Annika please yeah if I may add something to to this question um, Unfortunately, we don't have reliable statistics on um, um, number of people who are living in private uh, rental. So there is a confusion uh, between uh, saying that we have a huge percentage of homes in private ownership but out of this we don't really know how many people actually are not owners but their parents might be or grandparents might be you're you're right but but many people are not owners so they are out there on the on a private rental market um, um and uh, again uh okay uh, your parents or grandparents might have a home it, that home might be somewhere uh in a in a locality in Romania, but as you probably know, Romania is also characterized by 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 a deep uneven development regionally, and all the the um, development uh, is is accumulated in big cities. So kind of everybody uh, tries to go or abroad or to move to these big cities to to make a living because there there are the localities where the jobs are so it's even if you have uh, a parental home somewhere it's not helpful for you if you want to make a living somewhere on your own as an autonomous person uh, then again if say uh, we can we can assume that yeah okay your parents are in a big city and you stay in that city and you live with your parents uh, but but this this strategy actually is one of the uh, one of the mechanisms by which uh, um, we, we are faced with those huge numbers that Nora already mentioned about the overcrowdedness. So uh, half of the Romanian population lives in overcrowded homes, which is, means that they are not uh, proper adequate housing conditions, right, to, to, to deal with. So it's, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a very what's sure it's it's uh, it's that we have a very low percentage of uh, public housing um but that low percentage wouldn't shouldn't make us i guess to 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 give up on this demand to to create more public housing as a solution to the housing crisis so this is actually our idea and again i would turn back to my question how can we imagine differently the public ownership uh, and how uh, public housing might be created differently uh, but i don't want to <laughs> monopolize with this now so if somebody would be interested later maybe we can return to this uh, thank you Eniko. i just invite you all to read martin's comment uh, to which i wholeheartedly approve uh, the, the lack of a German kind of rental market also tell, has in, implications for the kind of financial actors that are present in the housing market and then patterns of financialization. Let me go to some, okay, so I have two more questions, uh, one from a raised hand, Alexandru, and one from Norbert. So let me take Norbert's question first. Uh, <clears throat> and it's about the way in which panelists see the role of art and cultural initiatives 
in enabling a critical resistance towards uh, neoliberal ideologies and uh, also something about uh, the a new Bauhaus uh, suggestion from Ursula von der Leyen, from the president of the European Commission, uh, that would give the green transition a, an aesthetic dimension. I'm really interested in this. So how, how can we use these kind of openings in, in, in art uh, for the kind of ideas that uh, you want to see develop uh, as alternatives to neoliberalism, as solidarity economy? Aggie. Actually, I would shift this to Martin first. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so there is an article about that also in Fordulat, and uh, one of the authors is also with us, uh, Christoph. Uh, but in short, uh, we approached it uh, generally that uh, solidarity economy uh, as a network pro can provide uh, artists also the means of social reproduction as for any other human being uh, but in the meantime it as culture is 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 obviously a necessary part of of any movement uh, it can they can join about these propagating ideas but what is obviously what mm. this whole thing is based on or like debates around cultural production and and relation of of movement that if there is a connection to such a movement, isn't it just a transit, uh, like a expression of ideologies and all that uh, are dominated by, by propaganda. And obviously what we were trying, I mean, trying to express in that, that most of the cultural laborers are already who are working in the autonomous field or autonomous art, uh, very much working in 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 the creative industry, and this idea of of living from the autonomous art is basically non-existent now. We were just I don't know making a small research uh, during the the first lockdown, and like eighty percent of the of the asked artists doesn't have a gallery at all, and and they are very much in in the culture and. Industry, embedded in the cultural industry, which is obviously quite a precarious job in Eastern Europe, especially. Uh, and solidarity economy networks are basically the alternative of that kind of uh, heteronomous uh, whole of cultural production. Uh, and in the meantime, yeah, culture is necessary. Uh, but Christoph, do you want to complement? Yes, just to add one thing. So yeah, so there is a this typical polarity that on the one hand there is this there are these autonomous artists who are really making artworks about important and uh, central and crucial social pro problems, but uh, their art we reach a large audience, usually remains in the galleries or literary circles and so on. And on the, on the other hand, there is this creative industries which are rising everywhere in which artists are really having or creative workers are really having an impact on social life but their work or labor are integrated in the capitalist uh, mode of production and accumulation so yeah the whole idea is that this yeah network of solidarity economy on the one hand could provide a uh, living uh, for for artists to somehow uh, eliminate their precarious positions and on the other hand, they could involve them into the actual making of, of social change. So instead of making artworks about the social change, artists could or cultural producers could really become the part of social change. To really shortly, I just wanted to put it. Thank you. Uh, Agi, did, did you want to say something or in response or? Oh, no, thanks. Okay, then I, can I go to Alexandru Bogus? Bogus, uh, he had his hand up. Uh, would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, no, um, I, put, I just wanted to respond to something, but I think Enika did it very well. Uh, and I already lowered my hand. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, the only thing I would add is like, um, what Agi said about Hungary happened obviously here also after like, after 90, okay, yeah, the houses were privatized, but to the 
people who really lived in them. But like in some years with this process of restitution of former properties to their old bourgeois or whatever owners from the interbellic, a lot of the people were effectively kicked out. So yes, we have private property, but like we don't know exactly who lives in there and how much of the people actually, actually we do know the people don't live in that much because we have overcrowdedness. So yeah, but that was all. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, I, I'd have a brief, um, well, uh, question regarding this issue of, uh, well, the way in which in transition, you had this switch to private ownership of uh, the public stock of housing. And I mean, of course, we don't have a lot of details on the tenure structure and who exactly uh, owns these countries in Central and Eastern Europeans. Um, the only thing I could find is in a sort of uh, uh, document that I'm just going to, uh, well, in some kind of document I just shared now, which does seem to suggest, for instance, for Romania, the fact that in uh, the 2010, you would have 90% of uh, uh, houses owner occupied and only around 10% in rental. Now, I don't want to enter the debate in regards to how much this really is accurate. But I'd wonder, considering the very different uh, ownership structure in Central Eastern European countries to Western European countries, how can um, uh, basically a movement for um, social housing uh, really um, uh, make its point politically in these big cities? Because it seems to me that uh, whereas this is a, an issue in uh, big Western cities, it would be a big issue in Berlin and in many other cities, it doesn't really manage to come to the forefront in, uh, even in the largest of cities in uh, Central Eastern Europe, or at least in Romania, in Bucharest and in Cluj, it still remains somehow a bit of a an issue that we, all of the people who are left-leaning to an extent, are aware of, but it doesn't really reach uh, a wider public. Or maybe I'm wrong. Um, that would be my issue. I don't know if I was clear enough, so sorry. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Marton or Agi, which, whichever of the two want to take this, and then I have a question from Veda Popovic, and then we're, we're going to wrap it up because I need to leave what uh, at, on the hour at six or here, eight in, the, in Romania, seven in Hungary. So. If I may add to the Romanian part, um, um, yes. Alexandru just said that it seems that not even in the big cities from Romania, like Bucharest and Cluj, uh, even if there is some movement around and uh, there is an effort to politically construct, uh, the demand for more public housing, uh, as Alexandru, I don't know, Alexandru, you said that uh, um, it's not um, mobilizing enough people, or I don't know what was your your exact term. Um, yeah, but I, actually, this is a, a larger question for movements, generally speaking. So, how movements are actually constructing their political messages? And what does it mean that it has or it does not have a large impact? Um, because uh, on, based on our, our researches, uh, our, uh, our experiences as activists, uh, we can conclude that there is a need for, for alternative housing, I mean, uh, non for profit housing, right? Uh, there are there is money in these big cities because they are not poor anymore, so there will be public budget to be invested. But the pl political decisions uh, are uh, actually for uh, providing opportunities for real estate development. So, but what we see is that there, there is a need, but people don't really want to uh, express that need because it's a kind of a shame, you know, to depend on the state. Uh, if you demand social housing still after 30 years 
of capitalist transformation, you are blamed being a communist or being nostalgic about Ceausescu. Um, this idea of meritocracy that Daniela mentioned at the beginning is very much with us. So uh, young people who are attracted to these big cities as so-called magnet cities, are really already created as subjects who are not allowed to think about needing a social housing, you know? We are created as subjects who are uh, meritocratic, competitive, and we have to prove that we can provide housing from the market. So therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a low expression of the need, but yeah, it's, it doesn't mean that the need is not there, so, but how can we politically uh, construct this uh, in a larger movement? That's the issue. Mm. Thank you, Enrique. I'm just going to give uh, Veda Popovic the last question. May, can you formulate it succinctly, please? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, just a shout out to everyone. Um, I see a lot of comrades on this call and it's like, it's really exciting to, to see you all in the same room, so to speak. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, and I think kind of my, it, I'm not, I don't have a question, it's just a comment. Um, and I think it's actually, maybe it will fit well to, towards the end of the discussion. And that is, I'm just inviting all of us to think about uh, not what, um, you know, what Eastern European lacks, uh, which is, uh, you know, it is the norm and it is the, you know, the, the imperialist norm for, for our societies and even for our social movements. You know, not to think, oh, we don't have that and we don't have that and there is not enough solidarity and there is not enough mobilization and all of that. But actually to think about what, what we actually do have from uh, the perspective of uh, historical, geographical subjectivity and um, uh, history. And that is, I think there is uh, in the context of Eastern Europe, a very specific and complex experience on what property is. And just building up on how housing movements uh, actually here are, um, are organizing um, and just building up uh, on something that um, some, um, some other comrade just earlier said about restitutions and on all the processes around um, um, the restitution of private, private property. All of these, um, all of these uh, transformations in the past, I don't know, it's more than a hundred years, actually give Eastern Europe a very specific experience and understanding on how property actually functions. When what is the, you know, the, the connection between property and the social and well, yes, yeah, the social state, the welfare state and to capitalism. And so my, my point is, um, you know, I'm, I'm really dedicated, as, as some of you already know, I'm really dedicated to, um, to housing movements here locally and actually building alternative, alternatives to um, um, housing and the commons and creating um, um, infrastructure for, for us, basically, um, and, material, and material resources for us. So my invitation is to think about solidarity economy um, and all of these building of infrastructures um, towards somehow some sort of a decolonial horizon of the abolition of property. Uh, but with this perspective, you know, with this, with this, all of this baggage that, that uh, Eastern European subjectivities have. And I really want to, yeah, I'm just very interested in thinking about abolition of property and how does that, can, how can that critical radical concept work concretely in our social movements and in building our, um, our, yeah, our, our uh, world. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Veda. I think you're leaving us with a very provocative question, given what Eniko just told us about the difficulty of scaling up this kind of uh, activist or alternative projects, uh, given how our uh, uh, how people across Eastern Europe have feel about uh, meritocracy and about the private property. So that's a, a, a complex question. Uh, we will not solve it in, into a Zoom meeting. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. 
Uh, I personally learned a lot. I was left with lots of interesting um, things to think about in terms of the opportunities that the concept of solidarity economy pro provides for us to rethink uh, spaces outside capitalism, for the complex connections that uh, solidarity uh, initiatives and practices have with the state, particularly if we think in terms of the green transition, and uh, the, art, uh, the aesthetic uh, aspects of this um, shift towards a, a green solidarity, whatever that would mean. And maybe Aggie will, will tell us in the next uh, conference or the next iteration of this. Um, thank you very much again, and I will see you all somewhere in real life or in, in, in a Zoom call soon. Bye bye. And, and if you can join me in applauding the panelists, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Have you. a good evening. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.